What's up, everyone? Welcome back to Moments with the Marcelins. My name is June. My name is Stephanie. His name is Kobe, and we are the Marcelins. <laughs> Our moments together will be centered on three things, transparency, tools, and truth. Yeah, so this month we're kicking off with a very important topic, uh, something that we do not just want to tread lightly with, and it's the topic of suicide. Um, we were able to actually interview a very special person. Uh, not only do we know her as a friend, but also um, as someone who we honestly look up to as an inspiration. Um, her name is Ceci Diaz. She is the host and a co-host of Benevolence Podcast. If you haven't listened to it, make sure to follow up and listen to all of her amazing seasons. Um, where she actually shares her story. Such a powerful testimony of not only hope and restoration, but honestly what God can do in someone's life if you allow him. Uh, within this topic of suicide, we definitely want to provide you um, as, uh, as many resources as possible. So down in the description box, you're gonna see a list of resources. Um, and some important uh, things for you to know and also, you know, if you know someone who needs help. Um, the first resource I wanted to let you know of is the uh, National Suicide Prevention um, Lifeline. The phone number is 800-273. 8255 and on this website their website is actually suicidepreventionlifeline.org um, you're going to find a lot of resources not only for yourself if you feel like you're struggling with something um, in your life but also if you know someone who is struggling it really kind of prepares you and gives you the tools and resources um, on how to handle certain conversations and different things like that so i hope your life is blessed by this interview um, and stay tuned at the end as we kind of discuss it a little bit further well, what's up, everyone? Welcome back to Moments with the Marcelins. My name is June. My name is Stephanie. And we are the Marcelins. Our moments together will be centered on three things, transparency, tools, and truth. We are very excited because we have a very special guest, a friend for yes. many years, who actually is someone who um, actually inspired me to do a podcast because she also has a podcast of her own yes. called Benevolence. And so we are pleased to have Ceci with us today. How are you, girl? What's up, God? <laughs> it's an honor for me to be on your podcast, Moments with the Marslands. Um, it's thank you for considering me, and I'm so happy to be here. <laughs> long overdue. Yes. Long overdue. Absolutely. Yes. So we're just so excited. Um, I have been blessed by your story, your testimony, your podcast, and who you are in and out of you know social realms. And so I just am so excited for this conversation and your transparency as well. Absolutely. So, Ceci, let's just go right in. Can you just share a little bit about yourself and your story? Absolutely. Um, like I said before, um, I'm so honored to be on this episode um, for this new season. I'm so grateful to see you guys again. I love you guys so dearly. Um, but basically, for you listeners out there, my name is Ceci Diaz. Um, I'm 34 years old. I am originally from Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Um, I've lived in Orlando, Florida for the past 16 years. Um, and I have a wonderful, amazing husband that it's a, we're about to be 10 years married. And um, I have a beautiful um, daughter. Her name is Victoria. She's six years old. Um, it's been, it's, it's been a crazy ride, fun and exciting. Um, and gosh, it's been really, you know, God's been good. God's been good to us. Um, a little bit about me. Um, I, like June had mentioned before, I do have a podcast. It has a lot to do with my story. It has a lot to do. Um, it's kind of, God just kind of put into me to just speak my story. And I'm just so blessed to be here to share my story with your audience. Um, I come from a pretty Christian background. Uh, I, my father has always been a minister um, of the music in, in several churches along the city of Philadelphia. Um, my mother was also involved heavily in, in ministry. So I pretty much grew up in church my whole life. Um, at the age of five was one where and we'll talk about it a little bit later on, but it has a lot to do with um, things that, you know, kind of, it's just the, the path that it was just the start of it. So mm -hmm. at the age of five, unfortunately, um, I was sexually assaulted by um, a volunteer uh, in, in the nursery. 
um, at my at the church in Philadelphia at the time. And it was ongoing for about a month and two months to two months. Um, I was five years old. Um, and back in the days, that's like, I don't know, it's like early 90s. That's just something that wasn't spoken about. That was something that just, you know, uh, I don't I don't recall that particular individual threatening me to keep silent. But I just already felt that that was just something I shouldn't I shouldn't be sharing with anyone. Mm -hmm. um, so I did it. And <laughs> I went on with other experiences. Um, I was introduced to pornography at a very early age, I would say about maybe maybe eight or nine years old. Mm -hmm. um, and it was because I was flipping channels on a Comcast um, cable. And, you know, when it gets to the channels that are in the thousands, you know, it gets kind of kind of weird out there. So I remember seeing my first picture of pornography and, and whole video and and I was um, immediately exposed into that as well and from then on I struggled I struggled with pornography I was an only child um, I grew up an only child I had access to the internet um, you know the big bulky computers I had access I had access to AOL I you know and I just worked my way in there and that became a you know a, a habit a habitual sin, you know, so to speak. Mm -hmm. um, and I didn't really know that it was wrong. I just did it because it was just something that pleasured me at the time. And, and it was, you know, it was pleasing to the eye. It was pleasing to the body. And, you know, it's just, I kept on for, mm -hmm. for many, many years after that. So that was something that I struggled in secret that no one really knew about until I became an adult. Um, moving on into my teen years, still heavily involved in church, all the while, you know, struggling with uh, pornography and struggling with that, that trauma that I experienced as a child, um, bottling it, it inside. No one knew, you know, but still heavily involved in church, still being used. God still, you know, doing his thing in my life. And then at the age of around 18 or 19, I went off to college. And that's where kind of um, my entire, you know, my life kind of took a little detour because I was really upset that we had moved to Orlando. Um, I didn't want to move to Orlando. We were living in Miami at the time. And um, I had a great network of friends. I came from a, a, an amazing mega church. And I didn't want to move. I didn't want to go to college in Orlando. I wanted to go to FIU. Mm -hmm. I was, you know, ready to apply right after high school. And then my dad um, gives me the news that we're moving to Orlando because he accepted a position at a local church here, which is the same one that I'm currently going to, um, you know, and, and I think that that kind of shook my world. Mm -hmm. And I kind of was like, you know what? Well, if we're going up there, like I'm a raised hell. I'm just going to raise hell. I'm just going to mm -hmm. rebel. Forget this, you know, and all the while, you know, I'm, you know, speaking in tongues. I had an amazing relationship with Jesus at the time I was being used in the worship um, team. I was being used in practically any ministry. I was heavily involved and, and I had a wonderful, um, wonderful, like teenage years in the church. And I kind of threw all of that away because I was mad at my parents and I was mad at God for bringing us up. I'm um, taking everything pretty much at the time is like, you're, you're ruining my life. You're taking everything away from me. Yeah. And yeah. I remember that I kind of made that decision that I was just going to rebel. And I did. And when we finally moved up to Orlando, I met a, I met a boy and he was not the guy that I was supposed to be with. There was many red flags um, and I took that as an opportunity to, to, to get back at my parents um, for making me move mm -hmm. and um, from taking everything away from me, pretty much. And I got into this relationship. I gave everything that I had worked up all the way up until 17 years old, um, my virginity, you know, everything. And I gave it all to him and pretty much to, you know, just... Just to kind of just say, you know, screw you, parents. <laughs> screw, you know, I was just very, very bitter with the situation. 
Um, he consumed my world. That that boy consumed my world. I turned my back on my parents and I and I fell into a deep depression because of that. I turned my back on God. Um, I stopped going to church. And, you know, I, I just committed my entire life to this individual, knowing that he wasn't the right one for me. He wasn't. But at the time, he was my everything. And at the time, he was the person that I wanted to marry. Um, and I, I, we lasted about two years, two years in the relationship. And during the course of the two years, I fell into depression because of the control that I was getting from him. Um, it was very, there was no trust within the relationship and it was very manipulative. Um, both, you know, myself towards him and him towards me, it was just very toxic relationship and we did not trust each other. So I fell into depression. I remember I started, you know, cutting um, just because I didn't know how to relieve the pain. And um, at the end of the second year, I would say like towards the end, like in December, that's when I found out, you know, that he was being unfaithful to me in the relationship and that he had been unfaithful plenty of times within the course of the two years. Mm -hmm. And I didn't know what to do because he kept blaming me that I was the one cheating and I wasn't. And, you know, I, I just, I just felt like my whole world was just collapsing at that moment. Mind you, I had turned my back on God. I had turned my back on my parents. I had no friends at mm -hmm. the time. And so him, it was like, he was the only person that I committed myself to. I made him like my 100% in my life. And, he, you know, he was unfaithful. So I made the decision and I don't know how I did it, but I made the decision to cut it, cut the relationship, knowing that it would be very difficult because I was already not happy with myself. I was being controlled in the way that I looked. I was being controlled in um, the who I spoke to. I couldn't say hi to the church, like my tr the church folk, you know, um, I couldn't say hi to any of the guys at church. I wasn't allowed to. Um, he didn't want my hair down. He wanted my hair up. It was just, it was very controlling. So I kind of lost myself in that period of time. I lost my parents, relationship with my parents with, with God, no friends. And when the relationship had ended, that's when I really felt that I hit rock bottom. Like I was falling deep into this pit that I knew was going to be very hard to get out of. I was already depressed. I had already anxiety issues. I was already being controlled by something. And now I didn't have any of that control. I didn't have someone to be there for me. And um, when he left, I had nothing, nothing. It was a huge void in my heart. It was a huge void. And, and I felt at the time that I couldn't go to God. I couldn't go to him because mm -hmm. I had turned my back on God. So I felt like since I'm the one that turned my back on God, I couldn't go I couldn't come to him I was guilty I felt so much shame and um on February 12th 2007 I'll never forget that date um I decided that I didn't want to live anymore and there was a huge trigger early in the morning and the huge the huge trigger was that the met my ex reached out to me and said that he wanted to see me and that he wanted to be with me again and that he missed me and that trigger was like, no, I can't do this. Like, I can't, like, I, I'm, I, I can't live like this, you know, with being pulled in all these directions and, and all of that. So I was like, I can't. So I remember hanging up the phone. I was in the dorm room at the time. I was living in a college at the time. And um, the four of us, which were the, I have, it was myself and three other roommates. We shared a bottle of pills um, like the huge Costco, you know, uh, I don't even know what kind it was, but the huge Costco brands, we had it right in the middle of our dorm, just, you know, when we had, um, you know, pain of any kind, we could just all share it together. And it was a brand new bottle. It was a brand new bottle. And I was just like, okay, I think this is it because I can't, I, there's no one I can go to right now. And I wound up just grabbing, opening that brand new bottle. And I chugged about half of the bottle. So I, I think it was like, like a thousand pack in there. And mm -hmm. I, and I chugged about half of it. 
So it was just a matter of like grabbing, poop, drinking, grabbing, poop, drinking about three or four times. Um, and then from there, I just laid down. I just laid down. I was like, okay, I'm done. Like, it's okay. Like, like you know, and I'm thinking, you're going to hell, <laughs> you know, because mm -hmm. that's what, you know, our church, you know, that, you know, that's what I was brought up on. You know, you mm -hmm. take your life, you're going yeah. to hell. And, and I was ready to go. I was like, it's okay. The pain is too much. The pain, the pain mm -hmm. on this earth is too much and I can't take it anymore. Mm -hmm. So if that's what it's going to take, you know, I kind of just really lost it at that time. It was really, really dark. And I remember just darkness all around me. And I was just like, it's time. It's time for me to go. Like, it's okay. You know, yeah. um, my parents will be all right. Everybody will be all right. You know, no one needs me on this earth. Mm -hmm. So I kind of just stayed down. I had laid down and I had not quite sure. I don't quite remember what happened after that. All I know is that my roommate was, I was in class during that time and um, she was in class and she felt moved by, by the Holy spirit to leave her class and to come to the dorm. And that's when she just came. She didn't know what to expect, but she was like, you know, something's like telling me to go back to the room. So she kind of left class midway and she wound up going into the room and there I was. And as soon as she saw the bottle that we had just purchased, you know, she already, she knew I was depressed. She knew I was going through a, a bad breakup. Mm. And she immediately like, just, she called um, our friend, our another roommate, like down the you know, across the way and said, I need help. Sessie did something, you know, and then they put me in the car. Um, they put me in the car and they called the ambulance because it started to gag and I started to like, mm -hmm. like I, I kind of wanted to throw up and nothing was coming out. So I had to pull over and then the ambulance picked me up from there. And mm -hmm. it was just a whole process. I was Baker acted. Um, and I don't know. I don't know how to, explain this but I was relieved that I was still alive I was relieved I was relieved um I remember drinking a whole bottle of coal and then the doctor's like you can't go to sleep you gotta wake up you gotta wake up you have you have to drink this you have to drink this I mean a whole like bottle of coal and I had to like drink and I'm gagging and they're like you don't you can't throw it up you can't throw it up or it's not gonna work you know, and, and I'm there gagging. And then this was in Lakeland. So my parents were over here in Orlando. So it was mm -hmm. just like they had to drive an hour mm -hmm. out and they were really worried. And, you know, my roommates did the best they could to contact, you know, my parents. And I was relieved. I was relieved that I was alive. I, but I felt so ashamed and I felt so embarrassed. Mm -hmm. um, I feel like that maybe if I had gone, maybe I wouldn't have to live with that embarrassment at the time. Mm -hmm. But I was, I was relieved. I was, I was still alive. I was relieved that, you know, that God saved me deep inside, even though I didn't want to even go to him and, or, or even, you know, come running or nothing. I didn't want to acknowledge Jesus at all. I was relieved. And um, I was taken to the psych ward of the, of the hospital so all the other people there and I'm like, wait a second, this is not where I need to be. I was put in a room with a lady who was just crying nonstop all the like day and night mm -hmm. and um, nothing. I just, I knew that this, this wasn't what God had planned for me. This wasn't, this wasn't it. There was more to this. Mm -hmm. And I remember just, I was very exhausted and I asked God, I said, uh, God, if you're there, because yeah, I just didn't, I didn't want to pray to him. But then I was like, I need to sleep. And this lady keeps crying. And it wasn't that she was like crying tears. She was like sobbing, like, huh, like, mm. like, mm. you know, it was like really, really loud. And I wanted to sleep. And I said, God, if, if you're there, like, cover my ears, because I'm tired. Mm. And I fell into a deep sleep. And I remember that night, you know, God, working in me and and i felt like he did a heart transplant like i i mm -hmm. i felt like i had seen like a i would say a vision or out of body experience you so to speak and i i saw god as the as the surgeon taking out the old heart and putting in the new mm -hmm. and then i remember just the next day just feeling so filled with life you know and that's from that moment on 
you know, I, 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 it took a while for me to recover from everything. Yeah, so I had yeah. to really like live with this guilt of like, I just attempted to take my life, you know, mm-hmm. and my family didn't understand. My parents didn't understand because it's kind of like taboo. You don't really talk about suicide attempts. You don't talk about depression. Mm-hmm. And, you know, my parents did the best that they could to raise me but that was not a topic that we spoke about in the household. Mm -hmm. So it was just like one of those unspoken things in our house up until where they started to see progress. Um, Then we were able to talk about it and things and stuff like that. Um, And to this day, it's still kind of weird when we talk about it. And my mom, when she hears my story, she still, she cries. It's hard Mm -hmm. for her to understand um, why I would want to take my life, but, yeah. I mean, that's just that's just something I did cuz I just I didn't want the pain. You know, I didn't want that. Mm-hmm. I didn't want to live this life in pain. There was mm-hmm. no one there for me, you know. So mm-hmm. um yeah. but, you know, God is good. I'm here. Um Yeah, it, absolutely. It's, uh, it's been quite a few years from 2007. I don't I can't do the math, but God's been good. Um I'm not going to say that from that point on I haven't suffered with the mm-hmm. same, you know, with mental health illness. I do, and I'm open, you yeah. know, that I do suffer from mental health illness. There are moments where, mm-hmm. you know, I, I don't want to live anymore, mm-hmm. but it's nothing to move me to, yeah. to get to that point, you know, of what I felt yeah. in, in 2007. Yeah. But God is, God worked in me, and I didn't even have to ask him for it. Yeah. And he worked in me. And from that day forward, I knew that I was never alone. And yeah. that the moments where I was in the rela- in the toxic relationship, in those moments where, you know, I had turned my back on him. He was there all along. He, yeah. he, he saved me from much more things that I can't even, mm-hmm. you know, save me from things that I, I won't even, I will never know. You know yeah. what I mean? Yeah. He was yeah. always there with me. And, yeah. um, and nothing god's been with me ever since so yeah. that's yeah. pretty much my story um you know <laughs> so sorry. that's 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 <laughs> powerful um i i get moved every time i hear you share your story and i'm so glad that our listeners get an opportunity to hear you um it's interesting that you know um i guess from what i'm hearing from your story when you talk about you know what you went through as a child you know um also kind of the moving you know, moving from your comfort, moving from everything that you knew, and then to enter this relationship, you know, uh, it sounds like at the root of it, you were trying to escape a pain, you know what I'm saying? Yes. And so I guess my question is, is once you got out of the relationship, was there a moment where you feel like, you know, okay, like, it's looking on the up and up, like, this is, I'm going to get through this, because you said that you received the message, and you know, you were triggered, during that process uh, of depression, was there some hope at all once you were out of the relationship? And I guess, I know this is, sorry, this is a two-part question, is mm-hmm. what gave you the strength also to end that relationship because you were in so deep? Like, what gave you that strength to do so? Okay, so to answer that second question, I, I don't know what gave me the strength. Mm-hmm. I think it was just so toxic. Okay. It was just... It was so bad. It was such a bad relationship that if I didn't end it, who knows what what would have happened. Mm. It started to get a little physically abusive in a sense. Mm. And it started, it was already verbally abusive. It started to get physical. And who knows what would have happened. Mm. It was very controlling, very manipulative. Um, I couldn't think for myself because everything that I did was a problem. And I wanted to find ways to get out throughout the two years, but it just wasn't, it just, there was just no way, you know? And I think with finding out that he had been unfaithful, I was like, oh, this is perfect. Mm. I can get out of this quick, you know? And he can't say anything, you know? Because he's been blaming me the whole time. 
Yeah. So now, it, you know, he's the one at fault. So I think, I don't know where the strength came, but I know that once I found out the situation, I just took it and ran with it. Okay. Um, now, when it came to him triggering me that morning, the triggers continued. Okay. The, the reaching out continued. He know what I he knew what I did. Mm-hmm. He knew what I did. And it continued, I, th- I would say, a whole nother year after that. It's after the fact. After. Okay. okay. Mm-hmm. But I think uh, what, happened, what happened was that there was this group, and I don't know if Junior remember, but there was this group called Outcry mm-hmm. um, in church in 2007, same year, mm-hmm. that had developed. It was a singing group. Mm-hmm. And um, I remember... Um, the leader of that particular group, his name was Jonathan Nevarez. He reached out to me because he knew I could sing. And he asked me to be part of the group. That group saved me. Because mm. I wasn't involved in church. I didn't have friends. That group saved me. It was like 10 of us. It was huge. And we sang at church and, you know, we did some side gigs, you know, and yeah. If I didn't get involved with that, like, I wouldn't have stayed grounded, you know, and I wouldn't have recommitted my life to God. Um, so that's that's pretty much what kept me right there, you know, but the triggers happened. The reaching out happened for about a year after until finally I was like, okay, enough. I can't yeah. deal with this anymore. You know, I'm suffering. It's like I'm trying to get better and I'm being pulled back again. So, yeah, Yeah. absolutely. Throughout your story, you mentioned a couple of things and you mentioned, you know, I know the trauma, um, the isolation, you know, being isolated, whether it was part of that relationship and being in that toxic relationship, um, having no connection, feeling alone, um, the distance, you know, feeling distant from God um, and then kind of like a level of hopelessness at the at the end. Um, what do you feel like was the most challenging part out of all of those different things? I know each of them had huge implications as to why, you know, it ended up being, why you made that choice that day, you know, but was there a a particular moment that you were like, this is worse than that, you know, or something like that? I think for me, the word, the word that stuck out when you were asking me this question is, was isolation. Mm -hmm. Cause I'm an only child and I dependent, I depend on friends. I've always depended on friends. I've always def- de- depended on family members and my roommates were there, you know, they were there for me, but it wasn't, it wasn't family. You know, mm-hmm. my parents didn't want any, they didn't want me even talking about the guy around them. I couldn't express anything. I couldn't, they didn't want to hear it. They didn't want, they were, you know, they were harsh. They were harsh, you know? Um, So I couldn't go to them. They're all I had. My parents were all I had. I had no friends. So I think the isolation had a really big um, part in my decision to attempt to take my life. So um, hopelessness was there for a long time. Um, and I, yeah, I guess, yeah, the isolation was the biggest part. Yeah. Yeah. I know that that is something that, um, I've struggled with, you know, throughout my life. And I know I've kind of shared my story with you too, um, where, you know, there were a couple of times where I attempted to take my life and I, and if I look back to what was that, the, I don't know, like the soil in that moment of my life it was that level of isolation where I felt like I had nobody to understand me, to see me, to hear me, you know, um, that you didn't have a voice and whether whatever you spoke about was not validated at all. You know what I mean? Like the, that pain was, I don't know. It's like, it didn't matter to anybody else. And then you feel like you're a burden when you're sharing you know what I mean? These issues with someone else because they aren't able to understand. Exactly. You're supposed to be grateful for your life. What do you mean? You're here. You have all this kind of stuff. And it's like inside you're just dying. You know what I mean? To even be heard or seen, you know? And so, you know, as you were sharing your story, it just kind of took me back to think about those moments. And, you know, that isolation is a huge, huge piece of that. 
Um, what would you say to someone who's in that moment right now that maybe they haven't reached hopelessness, but they don't feel like they have anyone around them? You know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I, I have some notes. Um, Good. So for, that particular, for, for that particular question, um, something that I would say to someone who's struggling and in that dark moment would be that I hear you, I see you, and I'm praying for you. And the reason why I chose those three phrases is because for someone who's gone through this, I don't want to hear the cliches that you are not alone. You know, God is with you. You have such a strong support system. Why don't you go get therapy? Why? Those are things that I, I knew. I didn't, I didn't need anyone to come to me and tell me these things. I knew them. I just wanted to be seen. I just wanted to be heard. And I just wanted someone to pray for me. Yeah. So since then, I've come across a lot of people who have gone through similar things that I've like similar, similar things, similar testimonies. And you can kind of gauge, do they want to hear the, the, you know, run to Jesus, you know, do they want to hear, um, you know, we're here for you, you know, not really. Sometimes they just, they just want to be heard and they don't want anyone to say anything. Yeah. And I respect that, you know, and I try my best to kind of gauge the conversation. And if sometimes they don't want, you know, you can kind of tell whether they want advice or not. Yeah. And if yeah. someone's going through a dark moment, if you're out there, listener, and you're going through a tough moment, like you are seen, you are heard, and you have people praying for you, yeah. whether you know it or you don't. Yeah. You know, um, you aren't alone. And that's one of the major lies. And I have that here, too. Um, you are not alone. Um, Jesus is with you, whether you like it or not, <laughs> whether you know it or not. He is there in the midst and he's holding you. Um, you know, I, I think of the prodigal son. I, I have to always think of that story. And if you're a listener and you don't know what the story is, the story in the Bible about a, a guy who just asked his, and his dad for all of the inheritance because he was out. He didn't need nobody. I'm out, you know. And in the long run, you know, he lived his life. He did his thing, you know. But in the end, he wound up with nothing, absolutely nothing. He was with pigs. <laughs> and, you know, I think if I would put myself in the position of that prodigal son, he was like, I could do this without God. I could do this. I don't need my father. Like my father doesn't need to support me. You know, I have, his, I have, I have his money. I have his inheritance. I got this, you know, so he's living his life without the support of his father, the support of his, you know, of his family. And he's just living life. And at the end, he just hits rock bottom. And then that's when he realizes I need my father. I need my support system. Yeah. And he goes back and his father with no judgments or anything runs to him with open arms, pulls a party, gives him the best cloak. And if you're a believer out there, we can't live our lives without Jesus. We can't live our lives without our father, regardless, yeah. you know, um, it's, 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 it's good to have our careers and our successes and it's good to be entrepreneurs and then want to, you know, want to excel in life. And, but without Jesus, we can't, yeah. we can't do it. So I, I always um, tie my, my testimony with the prodigal son. I thought I could do it without him. I thought I could yeah. do it without my father. I yeah. really did. Yeah. But no, it didn't work for me. So yeah. Going back to something you said, because you said something that just sparked something in my mind. When you were going through that season of uh, depression and, you know, you didn't want to hear the cliches. Now, um, it's it's interesting how nowadays we're, there's so much more that we're privy to, so much information now about mental health and, you know, both of you two, like having those, you know, those moments in your life, because I'm not going to lie, growing up for me, you know, someone trying to take their life, I didn't understand that. I was ignorant to that. 
you know, and then, you know, as time has come and even in my own experience in 2017, thinking about it, like I can understand why somebody would want to do this. Um, and then, you know, you talking about the community and I'm gonna get to that in a second, but something that you said that, that I really, that I really liked is that you didn't want to necessarily hear cliches, you know, what steps needed to be taken, but you just want it to be heard from what I'm hearing from both of your stories. And it's so interesting because um, there's a book um, written by Henry now, and I can't remember the uh, name of it right now, but he gives this example how sometimes, and this would, I guess, could kind of be advice to someone who knows someone who might be dealing with suicidal thoughts or anything, to be that person, to be the community. Because when I'm hearing in all of this, when I hear isolation, I hear all these things, like we're all in need for community. We all want to be loved. We all want to love and we need, we also have a life purpose. You know, we have an assignment here on this earth. And so when I hear all that, I'm like, okay, you were in a place where, you know what, I needed that community. And so for someone who is a friend or uh, a loved one of someone who might be going through this, like you said, like be there for that person. It's so easy to tell someone what they need to do, right? <laughs> it's easy to say, and people mean well, but it's like, and I've caught myself when I remember reading that in that particular passage in that book where he's like, you kind of absorb yourself over responsibility. It's kind of like, well, I told Ceci, I told Stephanie, you know what, they need to go to therapy. I did my part. No, it's more than that. It's about being that community, checking up, going over their houses, sending flowers, just, just being a voice, not simply telling someone A, B, C, D, what you need to do and check off the list. No, but being that community. And oftentimes people want to just do the easy part, not understanding, especially if you're a believer that, you know, part of discipling, part of being the community is going to take you sometimes rolling up your sleeves and getting dirty. This thing that we call like life and community, it's not easy. It's not, it's not for the easy, you know, for the swift, like this thing is like a process, uh, you know, for those that are going to end that. And so you can't say that, you know, you're a true believer or a follower of Christ or that you truly care for someone if you're not willing to go through the ugliness of it and yeah. be there for that person. And so I just wanted to highlight that because what I'm hearing in the midst of all of that is, you know what, there was a lack of community that was lacking. There, It was a lack of community that was lacking. And it's so interesting that in this generation where we're we have the phone, we have all of these things that can connect us, social media, yet we are the most alone than we've ever been, yes. where people are disconnected. And so we need to get back to those basics, those fundamental things of being the community. How are you? And not just saying, how are you and walking by? No, like, how are you? And, and like, I something, I don't know what it is. You don't want to talk about it. I just want to let you know, if you do want to talk about it, I'm here, you know, and so. Yes. That's good. He's <laughs> <kind of good. laughs> so, Sassy, looking back at, you know, your life, what lessons would you say that you have learned? So I have three. <laughs> yeah. um, my first lesson, um, as I look back at the season of, and that particular season of my life, is that God is my most valuable relationship mm -hmm. and if i i can't have a positive or healthy relationship with anyone else if i don't have a positive and healthy relationship with father with my father with jesus you know and you know it's just it's just it's amazing to see that it doesn't matter how many times you've sinned or you've turned your back on God, God is just, he's just so merciful and gracious mm -hmm. and he's there for us. And even to this day, I still suffer with this whole situation of like, you know, things will happen. I'm like, I'm mad at you, God. Like you, you didn't look out for me. Like you allowed this to happen. And, and sometimes I won't talk to him for a while, you know, and I struggle with that. But that's my, that's actually my life lesson that I should, you know, that's something that I've learned throughout the way that God is my most valuable relationship. And in order for me to have relationships with others, to form that community, you know, 
I need to first have that relationship with my father, you know, with Jesus. So that's my first one. Um, The second one is to not blame God for the troubles in your life. Um, And that's something that I'm currently dealing with, like literally currently right now. (laughs) Um, You know, the, the book of um, the Job book of Job like Mm -hmm. that. He's, that's just the most perfect example of someone who did not, go to God and blame God for the things that had occurred in his life. Mm-hmm. And um, Job may have questioned why God allowed tragedy to strike in his life, but he did not curse God. And he did not, you know, he didn't do anything or accuse it anything, you know, and, and God eventually blessed him, you know, tenfold after that. But um, Job is definitely someone that I have to keep reminding myself, like, he had it bad. (laughs) He got his sons taken away, you know, his, his, everybody was taken away from him, all of his possessions. And he still was like, I'm going to praise you. I'm going to worship you, you know? And that's something that I've learned throughout this time, you know, don't blame God for the, for the troubles that you have in your life. Um, And the third one, which is pretty simple is that we aren't alone. Um, God is with us. He, he will never leave us. He will never forsake us. He hears our cries at night when we don't understand things or we're suffering. He hears us. He sees us and he's there for us. And, you know, there's God, but there's also the enemy and the enemy is going to try to put things in our mind and get those negative thoughts of like, we're alone. We have no community. We are not validated. We are not being heard. We are not being seen. And those are lies, you know. God sees us, God hears us, and he's walking alongside us, no matter what. So those are my three lessons. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for being so transparent. Yeah. Like, that's one of our core values, as we said in every before every episode. And so just... We really uh, thank you. Thank you for that. Yeah. So yeah. Um, if anyone is trying to get in contact with you, to try to connect with you, how can we reach you? Well, the best thing is through Instagram. <laughs> um, you can follow my personal account, it's God. Um, it's the, the handle is at I am Ceci Diaz. Um, or you can hop on, you know, my podcast, Benevolence yes. Podcast. Yes. <laughs> you can reach out um, through there. Um, you can just either Google Benevolence Podcast. There's a website. There's um, an Instagram as well. Um, and, you know, if you're curious to know a little bit more specifics about my life, um, you can just start from the beginning. There's seven seasons there of, yes. of stuff you can listen to that I know that it'll bless your life. And you can always reach out to me through email. The email's linked also um, on both my personal account and Benevolence Podcast. So always here for you guys and always praying for you listeners out there because I know that it's not easy. It's not easy. Yeah. Well, you are killing it, girl. Yes. Keep killing it. Like I said in the beginning. As I continue to say, you are inspiration. Don't let anyone tell you otherwise. You are making an impact, girl. We are proud to be your friends. And thank you again for joining our platform and sharing your story. Absolutely. Love you guys so much. Thank you guys for having me. (laughs) The best is yet to come for us. That was such an amazing conversation. I hope you all enjoyed it as much as we did. Every time we hear Ceci's story, we're just touched and moved. It's always something... Uh, different that we also learn as well and so uh, make sure that you also subscribe to Benevolent Podcast uh, where you can hear her and Nisha do their thing and so that's great and so um, if you haven't already go ahead and like and subscribe Uh, leave a review on this video as well tell a friend about it and uh, stay tuned for next week absolutely as always within the topic of suicide we do have a lot of resources down in the description box uh, below do not pass on those those are great tools not only for yourself but also for someone else um, i was truly touched by her story like i kind of shared within the video something very personal to me as well and so um, just to let you all know listeners you know as you're viewing this video or uh, listening to the podcast you are not alone um, you can reach out to us you know what i mean if there's ever something that you feel like you need prayer for 
um, you know, need to be heard or seen um, in regards to. And so we know that God loves you. We care for you. We pray for you. And again, truly, I'm honored that you all, you know, catch up to our episodes, uh, catch up with our episodes every single week. So thank you again for being a faithful listener. Um, take care. God bless and, and much, much love. love. Peace.